Well, let me share with you a couple of announcements real quickly before we get into uh, the study and before uh, uh, we uh, start recording. So we turn with me to the book of Romans. We're in our study on the book of Romans, and uh, it's going to be uh, exciting to get into two books, especially two, two challenging books, because uh, Romans is probably the zenith book, as I shared with you, of doctrine, because uh, it is the story of uh, God's salvation, it's a story of sin, and it's the revelation of sanctification. Sanctification that you and I grow up and become more and more and more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What if we had a world of just little bitty babies around? Someone said that we really are living in a world where a lot of people are, are acting very immature in how they live and walk and behave. But the reality of it is, every one of us that are saved by the grace of God, God wants you to go on. God wants you to grow. And growing takes time. Think about it for a moment. You know, as you grow in your spiritual life, there's a whole lot of things that are involved. You have to have a change of clothes from time to time. I can't wear what I wore in the sixth grade. Now, some of you might. Uh, there are some people that are smart that way, and they stay the same size, seem like all through life. And, uh, you know, I can remember this time when my mother would say to Dad, hey, well, he's out of his shoes. You're gonna, we're going to have to get him a, buy a pair of shoes. And I love those Converse tennis shoes, and they didn't last me very long. But our Lord tells us to grow up in our conversation. Converse doesn't mean just, uh, uh, you know, our talking, but it means our walk. Now, in the book of Romans, you remember that Paul is addressing a Jewish audience. And so that's one of the challenges that we face whenever you uh, study the book of Romans because there is a little challenge there to the audience that is being represented. Now, but Paul is making it very clear in the early chapters he's going to be dealing with sin. Second of all, he's going to be dealing with salvation. And then third of all, he's going to be dealing with sanctification. In other words, he's telling them what we really are, who we really are, and then how we can come to faith in God through Jesus Christ, and then what God expects of us. Now, do you ever stop and think, what does God expect of me? You know, sometimes we, after we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we say, well, I'm saved, I'm, I'm going to heaven, and so I've, I've got my salvation, and so that settles it. No, God tells us to, to grow and to walk and to continue on. As a matter of fact, when you get around a mature Christian, it's very humbling. You know, don't have to be a famous person. Don't have to be somebody that has a... But when you get around a mature Christian, they're very humbling. Uh, because, you know, they don't get afraid and they don't look at the world like you and I look at the world sometimes. They know that God's in control and they know that everything is, is going to be all right. Well, now, Paul in Romans chapter 3, let me just give you a little background. In chapter 1, he has told those that are without Christ that God has put his witness inside of us. You remember I shared with you that on every single cell in your body is the fingerprint of God. There's no such thing as an atheist that don't have a knowledge of God. Why? Because an atheist didn't create himself. Every one of us have been created and given life by holy God. Now they have the uh, 4D... Uh, ultra D uh, sonograms where you can see that little life and that movement of that little baby inside the womb. And so God made us and we didn't make ourselves. And, but Paul is saying to the sinner, there is that witness of conscience. There's the witness of creation. There's witness all around us. And then the Jews in chapter 2, they're saying, yeah, look at you guys. Look at the way you all are. You know, we've got to step up on you all. Well, Paul is saying, you're equally as guilty. Because the reality of it is, you stand sinners as well. There's no such thing as an automatic Christian that comes into this world or an automatic redeemed person. And the Jews were really struggling with that. And that's why you get to chapter 3 because the Jews were thinking, now wait a minute, we're Jews, we have circumcision? And you're telling us, Paul, that we're not going to heaven because of all these things that we do? You know, that's the reality in some people. It's very hard to get them lost. So it's very hard to see them come to faith in Christ because they just can't believe that they're not going to heaven. Do you know somebody like that in your circle where they just have a hard time believing they're lost? They live good. They do good by their standard and, and they don't hurt anybody. They give to noble causes. They attend church on a regular basis. 
And uh, so they say, surely to goodness, if anybody's going to heaven, you know, this person's going. Worst of all is, you know, they've, they've done good to everybody. They've not hurt anybody. They've not done... Now, you may have never seen them step foot inside a church, but uh, they don't do any harm to anybody. And so Paul is going to literally give argument in, in Romans chapter 3. He's going to argue. Now, here's the way it goes. Have you ever been in a court of law and listened to them uh, argue cases? And uh, they'll be arguing back and forth. Well, Paul basically is stating what some of them would be saying in that situation. So, you know, they're saying, okay, Paul, if we don't have a relationship with God, if we're not going to heaven being a Jew, what's the advantage then of being a Jew? What's the good of being a Jew? So I want you to follow along in your outline. And uh, some things may be a little challenging, but just listen and we'll walk through them. What advantage then has the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy saying, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who takes vengeance? I speak as a man, God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God had more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather as we be slanders are reported, as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. Now I want you to listen to it out of the Living Bible. Because this maybe breaks it down a little bit clearer in your understanding. Then what's the use in being a Jew? Are there any special benefits for them from God? Is there any value in the Jewish ceremony, circumcision ceremony? Yes, being a Jew has many advantages. First of all, God trusted them with his laws so that they could know and do his will. True, some of them were unfaithful. But just because they broke their promises to God, does that mean God will break his promises? Of course not. Though everyone else in the world is a liar, God is not. Do you remember what the book of Psalms says about this? That God's word will always prove true and right, no matter who questions them. But some say our breaking faith with God is good. Now I want you to look in verse 5 very carefully. Our breaking faith with God is good. Our sins serve a good purpose. For people will notice how good God is when they see how bad we are. Is it fair then for him to punish us when our sins are helping him? That's the way some people talk. God forbid. Then what kind of God would he be to overlook sin? How could he ever condemn anyone? For he could not judge and condemn me as a sinner if my dishonesty brought him glory. By pointing up his honesty in contrast to my lies. If you follow through with that idea, you come to this. The worse we are, the better God likes it. But the damnation of those who say such things is just. Yet some claim that this is what I preach. Now, whenever you look in both of these translations, look in the King James and also look at the uh, paraphrase of the Living Bible, Paul is making a, a statement, basically an argument, to the Jews. And here's basically the argument. It's the argument about being a Jew. It's the argument about religious advantage. Let me sort of break it down this way. You know, we live in a world of a lot of religious upbringing. You talk to people in your family, and I talk to people in my family, and and, uh, ask them how they were raised, and say, well, you know, we were raised a certain religion. We were raised a certain way. And uh, are you going to go to heaven, uh, uncle? Are you going to go to heaven? At- well, I, I hope I'm going to heaven. After all, you know, you, you and me, we've tried to live good lives and we've tried to do what's right. And, uh, you know, that argument goes on and on and on. And so in chapter 2, Paul laid the foundation that there's no one good enough in their religion. Because the truth about it is religion don't save you. Now, what is sobering is this. There is a deceptive religion where a lot of people are caught up in. You and I will not know that they're lost until the judgment. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a passage of scripture that I put over at the end of the study tonight. You remember what Jesus said, and don't turn back there, we'll look at it in a moment. But Jesus makes a statement, many will say to me in that day. 
And the indictment is that there are many who are religious. Who's Jesus talking to? He's talking to the Jewish religious man in that day. And so what what Paul is saying is this. Outward sign of circumcision, or put it in our Gentile context, outward sign of church membership, outward sign of going to church on Sunday morning and on Sunday night and on Wednesday night, is that the assurance that you're going to go to heaven? No, it's not the assurance you're going to have. It ought to be a byproduct of the fact that you're saved and you're redeemed and you want to get in the house of God. You want to learn. You want to grow. You want to feed on the Word of God. And so since uh, he declared, Paul declared that being a national Jew doesn't save. Now, folks, that's an indictment. Why? Because you talk to a Jew and they think they've got it made. They think that you're, you and I are really in trouble. They don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah unless you speak to a Messianic Jew. And they think they're all right by the Ten Commandments. They think they're all right by the ritual. And so the argument was to Paul is, all right, Paul, we don't believe you're accurate, but let's take your argument. What advantage is there then? There's, is there any advantage in us being a Jew? Is there any advantage at all? And so Paul begins the argument. And so... He's, you know, if we're a Jew and we're born in a Jewish home and uh, we keep the Ten Commandments and we do circumcision, are you saying, Paul, we're not going to heaven? That's exactly what Paul is saying. Not only is that what Paul says, that's what God says. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You see, there are some people that don't believe they're sinners. Matter of fact, I heard of a lady not too long ago that uh, she told some people she didn't sin anymore. And uh, she, she really believed that she... She didn't sin. She believed that she had risen above sin. I don't know what she called it, but she didn't believe she sinned anymore. And so, uh, you know, here's the way their argument would go. If a man's born a Jew and born into a Jewish home and professed to be a Jew, a follower of God, then isn't he acceptable to God? Now, folks, there's a lot of people that have this argument. I want you to show you how deceptive and how deceiving the devil is. Well, now, wait a minute. I, I live in a Christian nation. We're not a Christian nation, but they'll say that. I was born in a Christian home. My mom and dad were Christians. I was delivered by a Christian doctor. I was even delivered on Sunday. And uh, my kids go to a Christian school. I graduated from a Christian college. So you're telling me that I'm not a Christian? And there's a tremendous deception about that. Why? Because there is the, the reality that outward form is enough. Outward appearance is enough. And so, and that's exactly what Paul is saying, the argument about being a Jew. Now, Paul wasn't saying that not being a Jew had uh, no benefit. As a matter of fact, when you look at the text, and I like the way that it's uh, rendered in the uh, Living Bible, he said, what's the use? Oh, being a Jew. Well, first of all, God trusted them with the laws. In other words, they were given the holy word of God. You know, we have the Word of God so much at our disposal that we take it so lightly. Just the other day, I was pondering about Ezra's time. In Ezra's day and time, the people stood for hours so they could hear the Word of God. Do you know that there are some cultures, they don't have the Bible in their language, so they will listen for hours to hear the man of God or even a woman who has the Word of God, they'll listen for hours because it is the Word of God. And that's exactly what Paul said. You've been given the oracles of God, their eternal value. You know, sometimes we read the Bible like we're reading a novel. You know, well, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. You know, and, 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 and it's the same size as some books. As a matter of fact, I remember having some Geometry books about this size, some algebra books about this size, some science books about this size. But have you ever seen somebody come up to you and say, man, I want to tell you that science book changed my life. Well, I can probably tell you some science books changed my life. I was in one study, I was in physics, and that physics class changed my life. I decided to discontinue that class and get out of that class. I didn't want to take physics. It changed my life. I didn't want to go there. And so Paul is making it very clear. Look at what the Bible says in John 3, 3 on the overhead. Unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Paul, are you saying to us Jews that, you know, just being a national Jew is not enough? That's right. 
And folks, the masses of people who say, I'm born in a Christian country, I live in a wonderful state, we have a good flag, we have great, some great Christian founders, and we had some very ungodly founders too. If you uh, want to read some interesting information, just read some information about Thomas Jefferson. Read about his Bible. Uh, that's all I'll say. But the reality of it is there are so many who are deceived. And Paul is talking to his countrymen. He's talking to those who are in the same lineage in life. He said, your Jewish nationality is not enough. Unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. And folks, in the judgment, it's going to be a sobering thing because so many are going to say, like Jesus said in Matthew 7, haven't we done many mighty works and Jesus will make an indictment. But the question is, what's the benefit of being a Jew? Well, first of all, they have a privileged position. Now, remember this. When we get to the study of Revelation, there's going to be some things that we Gentiles have a hard time understanding because they're reserved for the Jews. Jews have a special place in the heart of God. They have a special land, and they have a special rulership in a certain time. But we're all Jews who've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. And so, Scripture makes it very clear that they had a privileged position. You know, and second of all, they were entrusted, God entrusted His Word to the Jews. Think about it. Do you realize you owe your salvation in part to the Jews? What book of the Bible do you read the most in the New Testament? Name one. John, Ephesians, Philippians. What was Paul? He was a Jew. He said, I was a Jew. He said, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Well, so, listen, we have been blessed through the Jewish culture. We've been blessed, and God used them to, to bring the gospel. Like we're to be the bearers of the light of the gospel in our day and time. And so, they were entrusted. It was through the Jews that God would reach the world with his word. And then they were given the important message. Now, think about it for a moment. I don't know if you've ever carried an important message for anyone. I don't know if you've ever carried an important message for a governor. I don't know if you've ever carried a, an important message for some high official. My sister called me just the other day and she said, uh, I just got to tell you something. And uh, I said, all right. She said, uh, I just got to tell you, I got a letter from the White House. I said, oh, Really? And she said, yes, she said, I wrote him a letter. And I can believe that, that she'd write a letter and just... And uh, she received a very wonderful reply. And on the outside of it, it was the White House. Now, I've never received a letter from the White House. Maybe you have. But there's something special that comes with a, a, a letter like that. Think about it. God entrusting you. And that's what we've been done. We've been entrusted. Think about it. Every time you open the Bible, you're reading the Holy Word of God. You're learning, you're growing. Every time I stand here, listen, it's not just a little speech. What I have to say in 25 cents won't even get you a donut. It's the Word of God. It's only the Word of God that changes your life. And so Paul says, you've been blessed with the oracles of God you're to communicate the oracle, but... Does me speaking the Word of God save me? Does me saying I'm a Sunday school teacher save me? Does, does it say if I, you know, I've got a position in church? No. See, we get things reversed. And so, you know, Paul made it very clear. He said, you've got a privileged position. But second of all, look at the question of unbelief. Now, Paul knew that some Jews would raise the question about arguing that all Jews are sinners. And, and, and really, Paul gets deep. As a matter of fact, I like what Peter said. Peter said about the apostle Paul, he said, you know, his writing is weighty and heavy. And really it is when you read Paul, because Paul takes you deep. And so many of them believe that ritual was enough. Now, folks, there's a lot of people who really have come to believe their ritual, their formula. Are you going to heaven? You ask 90% of people in Corbin, Kentucky, Williamsburg, London, you ask 90% of them. Now, there'll be some people who say, you know what, I'm not going to heaven. 
But a majority of them would tell you and they could tell you what their criteria is for going there. Why? Because they have a ritual. The Jews said, well, now wait a minute, we're Jews, we was born Jews, we, we were circumcised. But you see, they had it in reverse. Circumcision was to be an expression of faith and the obedience to God. Just like baptism don't save anybody. I know some who come to me after they got wet and they said, Preacher, I realized I wasn't saved when I got baptized. I said, well, if you wasn't saved when you got baptized, you just got wet. Looks the same. The features are the same. But in the sight of God, you're not getting baptized because salvation precedes baptism. Never baptism precedes salvation. And they got it reversed. They thought their ritual. And uh, there was a belief that anyone who had outward Jewish ritual, they were right with God. If I, if I am a Jew by name, if I'm born into a Christian home, my daddy's a preacher, my mom is a Sunday school teacher, well, surely I'm going to heaven. You see, God does everything in his wonderful omnipotence to crush ritual. And here's why. Satan does everything for you and me to hang on the ritual. For you and me to believe that our ritual is enough to believe that, well, you know, I've been a member of the church ever since I can remember. Well, do you ever remember getting saved? No, I don't remember getting saved, but I've been a member of the church ever since I can remember. When I was five years old, I was a member of a church. Okay? Then I moved my membership. Then somebody else. And you see the ritual. And, and every person, and you hear me say this because you need to. Every one of us need to go back and say, here is the day... Or here's the time I place my faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior. And so, you know, a religion that is right before God has to have a blood offering. Now think about it for a moment. You know, Jesus himself, our Lord, said, Without the shedding of blood, there is no what? Forgiveness of sin. In the Old Testament, what did they do? They poured out the blood of, of uh, rams and all sorts of animals. Why? As a, as a shadow of what was going to happen in the New Testament. And so, you know, Scripture makes it very clear. You know, and, and Jesus even said to the Jews. Now listen, listen. Jesus is speaking to highly religious Jews. He's speaking to scribes and the Pharisees. And listen to what he says to them in John 8. You are of your father, the devil. Whoa. Why? Because aren't there, isn't there some orthodoxy that's leading people straight to hell? Sure there is. Well, no, now you can't be a part of us unless you do this, 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 this. And you look at them and you don't want to be a part of them. Can I tell you, God's biblical pattern of Christianity, there's a contagiousness about it. You find a real Christian who is a real Christian according to Scripture, not according to what you say or what I say necessarily, but according to Scripture. And it's there, and of course we share it verbally. There's a contagiousness about it. Paul was contagious. As a matter of fact, you know, and so Isaiah even said in Isaiah, you know, 55, 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. So what's he, what's he doing? Isaiah is making very clear that there must be a belief, there must be a repentance. Look at that. All the way back to the Old Testament. Isaiah, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Do you realize none of that has anything to do with formula? I mean, as far as ritual? Now, I know we get tired. Let me, let me just give you a little test. I know you'll be honest. How many of you get tired sitting in the pews? Don't answer that out loud. How many of you almost sometimes go to sleep? And uh, how many of you say, is he about done already? Because we're housed in a human body, aren't we? But here's what the reality of it is. The Lord knows your heart. So, Lord, I, I want to learn. I want to grow. It's not just a place just to come, just for come for ritual. Lord, I want to learn. And that's exactly what I say. Call on the Lord. In other words, a reality of repentance and turning to the Lord. And so, you know, and, and there are certain things that God wanted the Jews to know. 
God's not unfaithful. He didn't break any promises. You know, some will say, well, you know, if you let a Jew go to, go to hell, that's being unfaithful to the covenant. No, because God's not interested in outward looks. There's going to be a lot of church members that are going to miss heaven. There's going to be a lot of preachers that are going to miss heaven. There's going to be leadership, going to be deacons, going to be, tr- going to be Sunday school. Leaders. Why? Because it's not outward. I read something today that just, folks, it just shocks me anymore. Don't shock me, but it does shock me. Sadly, we have even come to a point in our Kentucky Baptist Convention that we're having to make stands that if you're a Kentucky Baptist church and you are endorsing or you look like you're endorsing homosexuality, that we are going to remove ourselves from you. And I applaud that because Christians stand on Christian truth. Why would you believe that? Why would you practice that? Why would you do that? Why would you endorse that? Why? Because you throw away the Word of God. You throw away the truth of Scripture, the Word of God. And Paul makes it very clear. I don't care if you're a Pharisee. I don't care if you're a scribe. I don't care if you're a part of the high court. If you are not redeemed, you're doomed, and you're damned would be the Word of God through the Apostle Paul. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works of righteousness, lest any man should boast. And Jesus is is indicting them. Why? Because they need indicting. Now, don't misunderstand me. But do you know some religiously pompous people? And you just think, surely to goodness you're not that way. They sort of look around like pity everybody that's not like them. There's There's a religious pride. Maybe they're known by others. Do you realize a biblical, what a biblical Christian is? Listen carefully. A biblical Christian is not really worried about being known by that many people. Do you know that? They're humble. They're, they do their business serving the Lord, walking with the Lord. They're not out for applause or praise. They're simply out to obey the Lord. Well... Paul, God wanted them to know, first of all, God's not unfaithful and he's never broken a single vow or covenant. Now here's the point. Some Jews are going to die and be doomed and damned. God's not breaking any covenant by letting that happen. Why? Because God never said outward form is going to save you. Just because I was born in a Christian home, am I going to heaven? No. I was born in a Christian home. My dad's a Baptist pastor. I was named after two Baptist preachers. My mother was a wonderful, godly... Now, I was given a lot of influence. And uh, I was even born on Sunday, believe it or not. About 4.30, right in the middle of a flood, the doctor told my mother, please hold on, Miss Bush, we'll get you there. That doesn't make me saved. And and, and the thing about it is, we've got a... there's a, There's a deception perpetrated all across the land that a person is right with God without repentance. And Paul is going to indict in the next few verses. He said, for all have sinned. Had a dirty thought? You've sinned. Ever told a lie? You've sinned. I like what a way one man puts it because he, he, you get convicted fast. He said, have you ever lied? And those he's talking to said, well, yeah, I guess I've lied. So what does that make you? He said, that makes you a liar. And uh, he said, well, have you ever stolen anything? And he said, well, I guess I have. So he said, so that makes you a thief, so you're a thieving liar. He said, uh, have you ever looked on anyone lustfully? And uh, he said, well, I don't know. Well, he said, there you go lying again. But he said that makes you an adulterous, thieving liar before God. You see, we don't want to look at ourselves bad before God. But folks, judgment is coming. And there is something that we don't want to face, we don't want to look at, we don't want to focus on. We don't want to focus on the fact judgment is coming to my life. And that's what Paul is doing. He's not trying to hurt their feelings, but he's trying to prepare them for eternity. And so, you know, God is after spiritual rebirth. What's the, how do you know if you're saved? Well, good verse of scripture, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. 
And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, the reality of it is, if you're born of the Spirit of God, there's a hunger in your heart for God. If you don't have a hunger for God, if you don't want God, if you don't want to follow God, if you don't want to walk with God, then you've not been born again. It's not a ritual thing. It's not something you trump up. It's something that happens to the new birth experience. Because Paul made it very clear in Corinthians. If any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creation. Now, that's hard to understand, but you sure know it when it happens. When all of us came into this world, we were babies. You didn't know anything about a baby, but you knew you was hungry. You knew you was needed some help. Maybe you didn't realize at that time, but later on you did. So Paul, God makes it very clear. Rebirth. And then number three, the question of behavior. You know, now this gets interesting because you can really get into amazing dissertation. And there are some people who have, by the way, we all have a fallen logic. You know that? Sometimes I hear somebody say, well, you know what? Now, it's not just, that, that's not logical that God would do that. Sure it is. You know, we say something like, when Abraham sacrificed his son, when God told Abraham, you say, well, God didn't really mean it for him to do it. Yes, he did. Read Hebrews. Abraham knew that if he killed him, God would resurrect him. You say, well, God would never tell somebody to do that. Yes, he would. You say, well, then how, how could God do that? Here's, your problem. Here's our problem. We have a fallen logic, Right? Are you a fallen being? Yes, you are. We're warped, and the best way to say it is we're twisted. You know another word for twisted? We are perverted. We don't think right. We can't walk right. We can't talk right. That's why the Holy Spirit has to do a work on us on the inside. That's why whenever, listen, left to yourself, we look at people and say, man, I can't believe what they do. Man, what would you do if you wasn't redeemed? Do you remember what you was before you was redeemed? I had somebody tell me not too long ago, basically in essence, he said, Benny, I was a rascal before I was saved. I was just really a rascal. And he said, I, I wanted to, but after, afterwards, I wanted to walk right. I, want, I wanted to do some things that I'd, I'd never done. Why? Because the Holy Spirit changes you. And then, you know, when he talks about the question of behavior. Now, look at it in the Living Bible, and I want to show you something, because this is uh, the easiest way to understand it. Some say, verse 5, some say our breaking faith with God is good. Our sins serve a good purpose. For people will notice how good God is when they see how bad we are. Is it fair then for him to punish us when our sins are helping him? That is the way some people are talking. And Paul's saying, you know, there, there are some who have that fallen logic. Well, man, if, if my sins help God show grace to me, then, then my sins are helping God out. You know, we are so fallen and we are so warped and we are so deceived that we sometimes believe that our sins, you know, sort of, God sort of winks at them. We really do believe that. Because have you ever said something like this? Well, you know what? I know I shouldn't tell that little white lie. Whoever said it was white? Whoever determined, why wasn't it pink? You know, whoever determined it was a white lie? Our culture did. Our world did. We did. God never calls anything a white lie. It's sin. You know, for example, let's suppose... Now, let's suppose I'm going to rip this. Have I ripped it? Is it completely whole? Now, watch this. It will never be exactly the same way it was before. I can put it back together. Now. Now, that looks more evident. looks more obvious. Yeah, it's ripped. The first one, well, now that's what we'd call a little white light. And so they're talking about the question of behavior. And so they're, they're saying to Paul, now Paul, our, our behavior, you know, if, if our sin... You know, it causes God to show more grace and kindness and love. You know, there's really some people who say, you know what, I know God loves me anyway. And some people say things like this, well, you know, God don't care how you act. He loves you anyway. Really? God don't care how you act? If I'd gone to my mother, she was about five foot one. Mom, I know you don't care how I act. You love me anyway. You try me and you'll find out. I can hear her say that. You try me and you'll find out. 
Now, she loved me anyway, and she wouldn't have thrown me out of the house and thrown my toys out and thrown the bed out on the front lawn, but she cared how I acted. And the truth about it is there's some who name the name of God, who name the name of... Well, you know God loves and God forgives, and I'm just so great. Yeah, but I'll tell you what. God's a wonderful Lord, and He's a wonderful steward, and He watches those who are not faithful, and He don't entrust to them much. Some people, God just gives them great insight and depth, and it's amazing how you, they, there is such a blessing to untold numbers. And then you've got some over here. Why am I not being used? Because you don't want to go on with God. That's what sanctification is all about. Going on with God. Say, Lord, I, my life is yours. Now let me ask you a question. Just ask yourself this question. Can you say from the bottom of your heart, Lord, my life is yours. Whatever you want to do with me, that's your business. If you didn't answer that, you really did answer it. And in the Jewish culture, they say, well, you know, let us sin. God forbid. Paul said, that's not, what type of God would God be? You know, listen to some people talk about God. Man, if, if God was like some people say he is, he'd be a schizophrenic God. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he's this way, he's this way, he's this way. And see, we've conjured a God in our mind that's not biblical. Now, what's Paul doing? Paul, what are you doing in, in dealing with the question of behavior? Because we all need to be indicted. We all need to be pronounced guilty so that we'll run to a Savior for rescue, right? Have you ever been about ready to drown? Have you ever come close to drowning? You may not know where it is, but Devil's Island, just outside of Middlesbrough, when I was just a little boy, we went up there to swim, and... Uh, I was a professional swimmer at six, in my mind. And I got in over my head. And I literally did get in over my head. I'd hit the bottom and I'd bounce back up. I couldn't swim good enough. And I knew that if I hit bottom, I'd bounce back up. So I'd just get back up and I'd get some air and I'd go back down and I'd bounce back up. And I knew one thing. I knew I needed rescued. wasn't a major thing. There's a whole lot of people around there. But my sister just reached out. She wasn't a, much of a swimmer either, but she was bigger than, taller than I was. And she reached out and she pulled me back to the shallow end. Now, I didn't want to make a big to-do about it. I didn't want to go on like she saved me. But she did. And you see, the truth about it is, Paul is trying to indict, making it, indict them so they'll ne see their need for Jesus Christ. Professional swimmers will say this, or professional who are rescuers, lifeguards. One person was in the process of drowning and this lifeguard was getting close to him, and the lifeguard was just treading water while that person was going down. And after he got back, somebody saw him from the bank and said, What was you doing? Why didn't you rescue him? Because he said, I had to let him become helpless, or we would both drown. Paul is wanting these Jews to realize they're helpless in their ritual, they're helpless in their form, they're helpless in their circumcision. Before, so they will see their authentic need of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And the reality of it is, when you look at the last passage of Scripture on the screen, here's a sobering reminder. Now I want you to understand, Jesus is speaking to religious leaders when he says this. He's speaking to the Jewish culture when he says this. Many will say to me in that day. What's the day? He's talking about the judgment day. Many will say to me in that day. Lord, Lord. Now the word Lord means master. Or in other words, I, I belong to you, Lord. Prophesied in your name. Cast out devils in your name. Many wonderful works in your name. Now notice the trinity, trinity of, of, of satanic uh, deception. They believe that they've done things authentically in the name of God. They believe they've cast out devils in the name of God. They believe they've done many wonderful works. Do you know any religions and any religions that are drawing a massive amount of people right now? And you don't hear any message of Christ? 
There's a church in Texas, supposedly the largest church in the United States. The problem is you don't hear a message on the shed blood of Christ. You don't hear about judgment. You don't hear about sin. Many, massive, numerous. But look at the last verse. And then will I profess, I will announce. Preacher, now let me put it, it gets close to the, Preacher, I never knew you. Denominational worker, I never knew you. Missionary, I never knew you. Jewish leader, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Can you have a fake salvation that leads you straight to torment? Oh, yes. And it's all bathed in ritual. Those who are not going to go to heaven, they cannot say this. Now, it's so simple. They cannot say, I know that I've placed my faith in God through Jesus Christ. They'll say, I've done this or I've done that. But there's no, no authentic salvation. Go back to that day and time you were saved. You remember where it was? Remember when it was? Thank God for the wonderful gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, how powerful and precious it is. And Lord, it's the power.